Hello, everyone. Welcome to All In On Real Estate. I'm your host, Aaron Goins. I started this meetup because when I was in the military, no one in my circle was talking about real estate. A lot of times we talk about debt, other finances, but nothing about real estate. So I want to start a meetup so that people can learn about real estate and start building generational wealth for them and their families. So I'm very, very excited to uh, have our guest speaking, Ms. April Eck, right? Eck? Ike. Ike. April Ike. Uh, we met at a meetup. Uh, many months ago, we had a great conversation. I really wanted her to talk about her niche, which is finances, and, and really educate people on that. So welcome, April. Thank you for the um, kind introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here. Yeah, so let's let's um, get right to it. Um, and I, so I want to ask you, and I always ask everybody, I'm starting to ask everybody this, what is your origin story? How did you get into finances? So I've always been kind of a numbers nerd ever since I was a kid. I wanted to be an actuary, um, which if you're not familiar, an actuary is the person who comes up with all the statistics, uh, percentages, all of, all of the wonderful things, you know, for insurance companies and um, risk numbers, all that great stuff. Um, and then it was an accountant and um, I did not do that. I ended up actually becoming a nurse. Um, but before I could become a nurse, I um, had to change the way that I behaved with my money. Uh, my husband and I have, neither one of us had a really great financial education growing up. Um, we were both from, um, poor households and um, the we knew just enough to get ourselves in big trouble with credit cards and car payments and debt and got to the point where we were just living paycheck to paycheck and uh, when the opportunity came for me to go to nursing school um, when I knew it was a, a, an actual possibility I decided we had to change things because we weren't going to be able to afford it. And our kids were old, getting older at that time and we had no college savings for them. So we turned our behaviors with our money around. Um, we were able to cash flow my nursing education. We paid off about $70,000 in debt and um, are now paying for two kids in college and one is already done. Um, and when I found that this was something that I could help other people accomplish, I jumped in just both feet. Um, the difference in how I feel now compared to when we were struggling and um, living paycheck to paycheck or feeling like we should have money extra at the end of the month, but we didn't, you know, that feeling compared to where we're at now, the confidence and calm that comes with that it's just uh, indescribable so being able to help people get to that point and then um, even you know moving forward from there achieving their lifelong dreams and goals has has been really great awesome 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 so what is your um just starting off what is some of your the main points this over your career when you started is that that you can just share that that really stands out to you. Um, so, <clears throat> I I I made some bullet points, and in looking at those, I see that there are a lot of um, parallels between you know just general financial coaching and financial coaching for real estate investors or any other professionals. Um, the number one thing that I cover with my clients before we even talk about numbers is um, to know their why, their reason for wanting to straighten things out and move ahead. Um, when you know why you wanna do something, and I'm not talking about the, well, because I wanna have money for retirement. I'm talking about sounding like, you know, a three-year-old and asking every level of why over and over until you get to the feeling that, you know, really just grabs your heart. And um, it's different for everybody. 
uh, for me, it was um, so that we could help our kids in school, something that we never thought we would be able to do um, so that they don't feel the debt crunch when they graduate. And ultimately more than that, it was so that when they get married, they don't have the money arguments and worry about being able to, I have three daughters. Um, I want them to be able to be sufficient enough to be a stay-at-home mom. You know, it just, it goes really deep. And when you know your why to that level, it becomes so much easier to focus on where you're going and what matters most in your life and what decisions are aligned with your, your why. So when you're keeping that why forefront and determining what money you're going to spend or how much you're going to spend or how much you're going to risk, um, that really helps keep you in line and um, keep you from maybe going overboard. So knowing your why um, and also having clear measurable goals. Um, measurable, yes, um, not necessarily the SMART goal system, which is great if that's what works for you. I have a system for my clients. Uh, we talk about good, better, and best goals. So even the good goal is an accomplishment and then you can move forward. Um, to meet the better and best goals. Always keep your big picture goal, you know, and in mind, but then also the bite size and immediate goals. Um, one feeds right into the other. <clears throat> oh, so right I, I think I think you make a good point with just talking about your goal, goal setting and things like that. Um, you know, as as you know, just as real estate investors and things like that, I think a lot of times we're taught, um, you know, put your money into assets that's going to make it grow. Um, and uh, it's going to grow over the course of time. You, you have interest, you, you have um, a lot of different things, taxation and things like that. But let me ask you this. And I think, I think this is one thing that I try to get a lot of people. Does your money grow while in the bank? No, not, not at any measurable <laughs> amount. So, so why do you think that we are taught growing up to put your money in the bank? I would say to have a sense of security. Um, I encourage my clients to definitely keep their emergency fund liquid be it in the bank or um, another vessel that's easy to get to because when you have an emergency, you need to be able to access your money. But I also encourage only, you know, depending on their level of risk, but a three to six or a six to 12 month emergency fund. And that's just covers your basic, basic bills and, you know, rent, food, car, you know, just your, not your cable, not, you know, Nothing that you can live without if you had to. Um, so, yeah, it's it's. I would say just to have a a sense of security, um, but you're not earning anything while it's there. You shouldn't keep anything more than your emergency fund there. Right. I love it. I love it. That's a gross. I love that. Um, I think we got to get out to more people because I think a lot of people are just saying, "Put your money in the bank. It's going to grow." No, it's not really going to grow. Um, it, it, you got to open your mind to understand that because you're always taught this. Um, another thing is, uh, have I think COVID has turned the, the world upside down in some aspects. Has you have any? Is anything that you have learned or your clients have learned with COVID, uh, with this COVID, COVID era? Oh goodness. Um... Yes, I, in, in terms of um, psychology, I think that that was a very scary time for everybody. And um, especially, you know, maybe even not necessarily COVID related, but with the inflation 
and housing market and you know all of those things being um so crazy i find people are wanting to hold on to their money more and um they're worried you know that they're going to lose or that you know there is a crash coming um but i i can't say there's any been anything directly covid related mm -hmm. um and during that time, I actually had to step away a little bit from my business because being a nurse, I was working all the overtime. <laughs> mm. Mm. Wow. But for me yeah. personally, it it did, you know, I I wasn't sure, you know, what was happening. So I did hold on to um, a lot of our savings and I did take that time while the student loans were at zero percent to knock out my oldest daughter's. A loan that we had taken out. Um, there was some concern about that too, people rushing to get those student loans paid because they kept extending it, but there was no telling, you know, when they would stop that. Wow. The wow. feds had the student loan repayments at zero percent. So that was kind of a big deal to people, that, especially people that were close to having them paid off. So, uh, um, I'm not going to dig deep into personal stuff, but uh, like for somebody like yourself who worked a lot of overtime because of your job, is there something that you would say, look, for this extra money you're making, I would put this in here or something like that. Is this something that you think that extra money uh, will, should go to? Well, the first place I would say it should go to is a liquid emergency fund because it's not a question of if you're going to have an emergency. The, the question is when um, you will have an emergency. And, you know, it's a, a personal decision as to how much you keep there. But like I said, I recommend at least three to six months of expenses. Um, and as far as where to put it, I personally don't um, give investment advice. I, uh, um, when my clients have investing goals, I <clears throat> refer them to an advisor or, um, you know, a professional that is aligned with the goals that they have. So if their goal would be real estate investing, I would send them your way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't, um, I don't necessarily uh, give recommendations. I'm not licensed to give any recommendations as okay. to where somebody should invest. Yeah, I understand. I understand that. I understand that. I understand that. But you um, should. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand it. I mean, you know, I, I think that you need to cover your grounds. I mean, I, 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 that's the main thing you're saying right now is cover your grounds. Make sure that you have that emergency fund because, like you said, life is life happens all the time. You just don't know it's going to happen at some point. You need, uh, like for me, uh, you know, my refrigerator. Uh, it's acting up. I probably buy me a new refrigerator. I got to have some money for that. You know, you got, you got to have a money for maybe something that's even more expensive. So you got to have that money just in case. And, and I think one thing too, is that um, we've seen a lot of people get laid off because of, for certain reasons, and you got to have some money in, in reserve to pay off the bills in the meantime. Um, so uh, for anybody who is, uh, Anybody who is is maybe a, is a young person or something like that, what would be some of the steps you tell them to do uh, as they grow in their profession or they get into something like real estate and they're starting off that they should do right away besides, you know, of course, getting the, um, you know, emergency fund? Sure. Um, so these are a couple more of the bullet points that I have. Uh, so thank you for asking. Uh, <laughs> number one, the biggest... <laughs> biggest number one, do not mix business finances with personal finances. Um, it, it's just messy and can get you in trouble with the IRS. <laughs> you want to have all of your business finances completely separate from your personal. And if that gets difficult uh, to keep separated, I highly recommend hiring a bookkeeper to help you keep that organized on the business end um, and have a good accountant, somebody that you can, you know, reach out to and ask questions of, or, you know, a mentor, somebody who's 
done this before you that knows the ins and outs of um, ways to keep it separate and ways to make it easy um, for that. But that I have some bookkeeping referral partners that, um, you know, they may get a client that has their, their business finances and their personal finances all mixed where they feel like they're doing good in one versus the other. And the reality is the complete opposite because they don't even really know they're not paying themselves necessarily. They're just putting all the money together and um, they've lost track, you know, what's going where and what their profit margins are. And, and there's just no way for them to discern those really important numbers, um, not only for running your business, but then also come tax time when you have to report, you know, it makes it very difficult to do. So yes, definitely do not mix personal with uh, business. And if you have to use personal money for your business, make that a separate transaction. I'm taking X amount of dollars from my personal and I'm funding my business account. Make it a clear, distinct transaction, um, a set dollar amount so that you can more easily keep track of not, oh shoot, I have to pay this bill for my business. I'm going to pay it from here. And it's $23 and 44 cents. You know, it, it's just, it gets real money that way. So if you have to, in you know, make it an injection of, of, funds into your business, that's fine. Just do it in an organized manner so that it's easy to track. Um, and then on the personal finance side, which is where I shine, uh, I love helping people make a plan for their personal finances so they don't end up in a really scary situation. Um, have a plan just like you would for your business finances and your business plan, have a plan for your personal finances. I encourage people, I teach people um, to track your spending for three to six months. Every penny, every source, every credit card, every debit card, every, um, you know, every cash spending even if you can. Everything that you've spent, separate it into categories, your grocery money, your eating out money, your gift money, what you spent on Christmas, what you spent on car maintenance and home repairs and the veterinarian and your utilities. There's um, a million categories, but categorize your spending and get a really good idea of over the three to six months, what was the average you spent in each category? Because using that number, you can plan ahead now to spend. Now you might see, oh my gosh, I've spent on average $600 a month on eating out and okay, fine. It's great and easy, but that's an astronomical number for me. Now for somebody else, 600 might be an okay number, you know? So when you see those numbers, if you need to alter them to make it okay in your head, alter them, but then make a plan for those categories moving forward. So for next month, I only want to spend $400 in eating out and I want to spend $600 at the grocery store. And on average, I've spent $100 a month at the veterinarian. So I'm going to plan to spend $100 a month moving forward. For all of those categories, when you plan ahead what you're going to spend, when your paycheck comes in, you you kind of know, unless you have variable income, you kind of know what your monthly income is. Then you can make it match up. If you have $5,000 coming in a month and you see you've been spending $7,000 a month going out, you know you're going to have to adjust some of those numbers, but you want to make your categories have the number that you're going to spend moving forward. I also make savings a fixed expense. It's not, it should not be, okay, I'm 
I've got all these numbers and this is what I'm going to spend this month. And then whatever's left is going to go to savings. You need to flip that on its head. You need to say, okay, I want to spend, I want to save whatever, we'll say $1,000 a month. I want to save $1,000 a month. And looking at the rest of my numbers, I can do that if I cut back on my eating out and my gas money, maybe I can walk somewhere, How whatever you have to do to make it work out so that you're meeting your goal, make your savings a priority just like you would your, um, oh, let's see, your streaming services or, you know, whatever it is that is, you know, or your rent, we'll put it up there with rent <laughs> or your mortgage, you know, you want to, um, determine how much you're going to save and then make it a planned spend just like everything on your your bills list. Um, so also have a category for spending and celebrating achieving your goals. Um, I know there are some financial gurus out there who say you shouldn't spend if you have debt. Well, if paying off your debt isn't your number one goal and you can manage to pay an extra $500 a month on your debt and you want to celebrate, you know, or need to go out to dinner just to get out of the house every so often, you should be able to fit that in um, within a reasonable amount, right? So, um, some of the categories of expenses are fixed and some are variable. So something else that I recommend for my clients is to actually have two checking accounts. Have one for your fixed bills, your fixed expenses, like your savings, where it's automatically going to transfer to savings and your rent. That money is going to be there no matter what. The, um, you know, your, your, gas and groceries and those bills that are variable, set your amount and then transfer that into your other checking account. So if you say, okay, I'm going to spend $400 a month on groceries and you get paid twice a month, you're going to take $200 on one paycheck and put that into your variable checking and $200 the next paycheck into your variable checking so that you have your grocery money. If you don't spend all of that money, leave it there in your variable account because you may determine that you are spending a certain amount for gas. Do the same thing. Make it a fixed ex expense. You, okay, I'm going to spend $100 a week on gas, so that's $200 a paycheck. I'm going to transfer over, but you're taking a road trip, so you're spending more on gas, so you'll have the extra money there. What you didn't spend on groceries is going to be floating around in that variable account. Um, you don't have to track that one penny by penny as long as you're staying within your planned amount. If you notice, okay, I'm cutting it really close in this account every month in your variable expenses, and I see that I'm spending more than what I planned for gas every month, then you might have to um, tweak it a little bit, you know, work, work with the numbers until you're comfortable. And it could take two or three months. Um, and if you have, you know, um, a month where things are off or you tell yourself you're not going to, you know, spend on fast food and you do, that's okay, right? Like nobody does anything perfect the first time. You're learning. It's a new way of organizing and it's a new way of uh, thinking about your money. So it's expected that you're going to um, have a learning curve and that's okay. I feel like I'm dumping so much information, you guys. Do you, do you have any questions or anything before I, anything you'd like me to clarify? Uh, okay, I'll let Aaron go. Hi. Uh... Yeah, give me like two more questions. I definitely open it up because I, def I know definitely what my man left. Just doesn't mean to ask. Oh no, I I just meant over what that bunch of stuff that I've. Go ahead, go ahead, Desmond, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead ask a question, Desmond, about that. Um, 
No, it was it wasn't on that particular topic. It was one of the questions I asked her. I wanted to ask her about her personal uh, preference as when it comes to like a percentage that you invest. Uh, do you have a certain percentage you like to invest? And what are some of the different velocities that you invest in? Like you want to see something turn around in three years or you want to put the principal back in five or 10 years or it could be bonds long term. Do you have different ones you do? I am not a super savvy investor, unfortunately. I uh, I know we're behind in retirement and we fully fund our Roth IRAs every year. Um, my husband is 50 and I am 47. So we are definitely playing the catch up game. Um, I am, I don't know percentage, but it's besides fully funding our Roth, um, it's about 1600 that I put into my deferred comp at work, which is also Roth options. So. Um, okay. Do you have a, um, is it flexible where it can be moved from the Roth? I, or I borrowed don't. against, borrowed against maybe. I know you can take out the principal that you've put in. I don't know if that's an option for me through work, but I think um, through the Roth mm -hmm. that we do separately. Okay, it, separately. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's all kinds of rules. And that is why I love my financial advisor friends. And, you know, I, I love my advisor and I, I trust him wholeheartedly. Um, I do educate myself to a certain extent, but as far as um, knowing all of the ins and outs, I don't, and I honestly don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. Uh, I, I love more the psychology based, like, you know, let's, let's find out. Um, it's amazing to me how people end up having the money beliefs that they do it could be one incident in childhood that puts this belief in your mind, like um, that having a lot of money is bad or that, you know, you're going to be in debt forever. It's, it's just a fact of life. Like you're always going to have a car payment and you're always going to have debt. It, it, I mean, it could be that way if, you know, if that works for you, but it doesn't have to be that way. If in, in your heart of hearts, you really don't enjoy making those payments every month and want to do more with your money. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of where I, um, I, I just love to help people. Well, from the psychology stand, I understand what you're saying, because sometimes, um, let me get off real quick. Some, um, when you hear someone talk about all the dangers or some of the mishaps, it's years and years and years. They're telling you in one sentence or one paragraph, but it doesn't happen every year or every month. Like all the tragedies over 20, 30, 50 years, you're talking about it at once. So it sounds like it's something that happens all the time and it doesn't. Like you said, you're going to have bad times, but it's not every day, you know. So, right, yeah. right, absolutely. I, I mean, the psychology better. Yeah, yeah we. Um, it is. It really is, and it's different for everybody. Yes. And yes. that's part of what yeah. I enjoy so much. Like I love talking to people, and I love helping people solve problems and figuring things out. The numbers truly are just numbers, but there are so many feelings attached to them. Um. It's it's that's really. True. It's really amazing. And um, I know that you guys being real estate investors and, and wanting to do more with your money, you fit right in with my ideal clients and, um, and, and myself. Like I, I wanted nothing more than to having grown up poor, I'm talking groceries delivered to the door by the church. Um, I had name brand clothes that were three years old from garage sales and <laughs> my mom was yellow <laughs> with their money. So, um, and my husband grew up even worse than that. So it was really, really important to us ever since before we became parents that we helped our kids go to college so that they 
didn't have to struggle like we did or not go to college. My husband does not have a college education. Um, but yet the psychology kept us in that same cycle until it really got down to like, here I had this opportunity where I could really make a difference, um, Mm -hmm. making more money, becoming a nurse, um, which is really funny because I, uh, I have a five-year plan to get out of nursing (laughs) and do my financial coaching full-time and, um, do some nursing education on the side. But, um, you know, it, it just is, is amazing to me. Yeah. So I, I, and, and you take me to the next question I was going to ask you. Um, I think a lot of people in real estate, our ultimate goal is to be financially free. We can do this full time. We can get to the mountaintop. We, we've got to the point. But everybody's different. And I and I, so, um, you know, I know one guy was saying, hey, listen, you don't have to be a millionaire to be financially free. All you have to do is able to pay your bills off um, and still live a lifestyle, um, you know, with with the money that you have. So what do you say to people who say I got to be a millionaire, a multimillionaire to be financially free. So when my husband and I started following our money plan, I instantly felt like I got the biggest raise ever. Like I felt rich. It was amazing. And we weren't making any more money. It was just where it was supposed to be, it was still in the bank instead of at the Target and <laughs> at Texas Roadhouse. And I'm not saying like you shouldn't go to Target or shouldn't go to Texas Roadhouse, but plan ahead for that spending instead of just doing it and then wondering where your money went. Um, all those little things add up so quickly. The $10, the $20, the $15, it's 20 bucks. Like who thinks it's 20 bucks? But when you do that 30 times in a month, <laughs> you know, it, it adds up. And do you know who the largest population of millionaires are as far as profession? Um, Percentage wise? Investor, real estate investors, maybe? That would be nice. Uh, but no, it's teachers. That's crazy. Teachers That's crazy. who have the lowest income, right? Like yeah, wow. for, for the jobs that we're always hearing how teachers don't make enough money. Um, but, you know, they, they, they're teachers for a reason. They're smart and they live within their means and per, per capita or whatever the term is, teachers have the highest rate of being millionaires. Is that because you're more disciplined? <laughs> I, I I think so. <laughs> it's got to be something. That could be, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think so. That is, Great. Wow. That that is that is something else right there. I did not think of that. Wow. Um, just one more question. Um, I know you talked about your five year plan and where you want to go at. Yeah. Um, and things like that. But is there any other tips that you would like to? include before I open up for um, the attendees to ask? Um, I talked about making savings a fixed expense. That one is just so important, doing it that way, planning for savings, rather, you know, setting an amount instead of doing everything else and waiting uh, to save what's left. No, I, I mean, I, I, would reiterate again, maybe, you know, having that, um, keeping your big picture goal, um, forefront, your why, and and just really diving deep. Um, Desmond, why, why do you want to be a millionaire? I'm going to do some, I don't want to be a millionaire. No, No, I don't want to be a millionaire. Why wealthy, you- maybe not millionaire. Wealthy, maybe. Okay. Uh, um, financial freedom for me 
would be probably the uh, same thing with Aaron paying off expenses, uh, maybe double of what I have uh, per month to pay off my expenses. And um, pretty much that's where I'm at with it. Um, Why would that be important to you? Oh, it gives me the freedom to travel more, read more, uh, more time with family, um, uh, and, which I do take a joy of, uh, especially the outdoors, um, just free time, freeing up time. Yeah. And why, why is time your number one? I think that's the most precious thing we have. That's the most precious thing because you can make a mistake and you know, if you wake up tomorrow, okay, you got another chance to go at it again. Um, so I don't put a number so far as units or uh, how many houses. Uh, it's just the uh, expense number. What I need to cover my expenses, probably times two. Um, yeah, probably two, three years of expenses uh, saved. I hope that would be enough, you know, to move forward. Um out of the job that I am. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. I like it. Time. Time is one of those things that once yes. it's gone, yeah. never yeah. comes back. And, and do you have a, I'm not going to dig too much deeper, but do you have a really personal reason why time is your? Sometimes I don't feel I have enough for myself. You constantly say yes to too many other things and it doesn't pertain to you. I'm not saying selfishly, but you don't get to do some of the things you want to do. And sometimes you have to say no yeah, yeah. to something else to say yes to what it is you're doing. And, you know, that's the way I see it. Like um, over here, I'm pulling over here. People pull you, family, friends, kids. And sometimes you just don't get to enjoy enough of your time. And um, I had another question, but go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm all here. Um, so that, that's my biggest why. Uh, and to help like others, to help others out if I can financially here and there. That's a great one too. And I guess generational wealth, like Aaron would say, you're leaving something behind. Mm -hmm. I could just imagine uh, if we were left with some of the things uh, that we plan to leave, you know, and then you have more time to read and study take classes, do courses, as opposed to maybe rushing out and getting a quick job because you're worried about the bills to be paid in your house. So imagine just starting out, I guess, with a house paid. You're not really worried about a uh, mortgage. Uh, it's just a tremendous um, stepping stone. So that's why I wanted to ask you about kids, family, and insurance. Uh, what age would you like to impart uh, those disciplines so far as finance and savings without it being overbearing, you know? I guess. Sure. Well, so my daughters are 19, 21, and 25. And you know what I bought them for Christmas? Books? Roth IRAs. Bro okay. <laughs> I sure did. Um, the minimum is $250 to open. Um, so I, I don't know a whole lot about the rules for this, but my girls are older. So I, I just had them opened in their names, right? Mm -hmm. But for the under 18 crowd, there is a custodial Roth IRA. Um, and I know it has to be earned income that is invested in those. Uh, but I know businesses employ their children, pay them a fair wage and invest in that custodial Roth IRA. So definitely something to ask an advisor about. Okay. Um, you're okay. looking to start the wealth building early. Okay. Uh, a college fund. If I could go back and do anything differently, anything in my parenting, I would, I would like, they could keep all the spankings. I would start the college fund. <laughs> I did not do that. And that is my biggest regret. Because now I have two in college at the same time. <laughs> I actually, and, and this is personal choice, you guys, but we, we live in a very good school district and we raised our kids 17 years in the same house. It was 
a four bedroom house, not super large, but it's about 2000 square feet. And once my youngest was going to graduate from high school and they were already, they were virtual. So it didn't even matter where we lived. I sold that house. I decided in December that we were moving and we moved in February. I downsized to half the mortgage and half the house size. And I did that so that we could pay for their school and still travel. Mm -hmm. And it's been, it's been wonderful, but investing for kids when they're young college fund and uh, those custodial IRAs. Custodial IRAs. You're smart. Okay. Very smart. I look into that. Again, I am not giving investment advice. I would get in trouble for doing that. <laughs> I am well, not a licensed advisor. Well, you give out valuable information that I think a lot of people need to hear. Um, yes. you know, Cause a lot of us are taught, like I said, a lot of us are taught a certain type of way. Are, are, are taught you've got to put your money in the bank um, and keep it there and you know after a while you know you'll work 30 years and then you have some money in the bank like you can grow your money more over the course of time and and, and I think you know you really talked about that and then strategy so that so I thank you so much Lawrence you got anything you still on here buddy you might be on mute you might be something to do but um uh doesn't he have anything else um, let me see. I wrote a couple of questions down. Did I ask them all? Um, do you use, uh, yeah, I was trying to look at the compound effect. Have you seen, like you said, over time, you said how the same salary, but because you was paying attention and you was allocating it, uh, substantial growth. And, and I guess it just compounds over time. And like you said, is it sometimes where you see a growth and you say, well, because I didn't spend, we have something even more extra than the last month because some months will be less than others. Right. And so how does that affect you with having extra money sometimes where you could probably put it towards something or buy a painting, whatever it may be? How, how has that affected you, the compound effect? That's a great question, actually. So first, I mean, I recommend putting any extra money towards any debt you might have um, because you're, you're paying interest on that and that's money going out. Depending on what your investment options are, if you, you have the opportunity to gain more interest that way, and then you, know, you may be more comfortable doing that. Um, that is you know, something that you would have to research knowing what your options are, paying off a credit card versus investing in something um, that would net a higher interest rate. Um, but you just put it towards your goals. Anything extra, put it towards your goals. Whatever your goal is at that time, um, I keep a spreadsheet and you know it, it calculates everything. Oh yeah, that's what I was actually, do you have a program? That's, use, that's another thing. I use good use old Excel. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, vert, are you, do you like spreadsheets? As long as they're not too much, but it, it, okay. So vertex42.com vertex. has a bajillion different spreadsheets and there are many different budgeting spreadsheets. Okay. Some very basic, some very involved. Um, I know they have one in there and I don't remember what it's called, but where you enter in all of your information of your spending for the last three to six months. And, you know, it breaks all of that down for you. Um, but it's, it's an amazing website. When you had your car and your car payments were almost over, the one thing I was afraid of is, okay, this money is going to come back in mm -hmm. quickly find where it should go or you don't see it. The next thing you know, like you said, you're spending it. And you say, well, I have no car payments, but okay. I haven't Where'd seen anything extra. Go? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. did you do that a lot? Um, initially, like immediately, yes. ha immediately have it going towards something else, a Roth RA. Yeah, for sure. Um, but that, that kind of goes along with planning ahead every month. So we're May 5th right now. I'm working on my June budget um, because I, I have, you know, everything set for May 
now I'm I'm transferring everything over to June, and okay. um, anything I have left over in May. Now you also have to consider the rolling months because sometimes you're good for the month, but then in the first half of the next month you might need some of that to come over. So I I definitely recommend set up two to three months at a time, especially if you're using spreadsheet. Um, so you can see how the numbers affect each other moving down the months. Okay. But yes, when you know you're gonna have extra money, find a good place for it to go so that it does. And that will also be beneficial, um, or I should say is another benefit of having the two separate checking accounts because that money is gonna be in your bill account. And if you, no longer have that payment coming out, then that money will stay in your bill account and you're not spending from your bill account, you're spending from your variable spending account. I mean, you're spending from it, but not with a debit card, right? You're, right. you're using automatic bank payments and bank payments. Right. yeah, good question. I've, I've seen uh, in some books and some podcasts where they talked about, um, using HELOCs, which use, you know, is a home equity line of credit and as opposed to a loan. And some people used it to, they would take their whole check and pay into the HELOC. And then as the expenses come through the month, they would use the HELOC to pay off normal bills. What is the purpose of doing it that way? I think they were doing it from a standpoint of, well, I'm not gonna use all of it or some expenses would be less, like you said, in this month. And then the next month might be over with, but because they have the checks going into it, they have more than enough in the HELOC. So, so for some reason they used it as paying down, well, they've used their HELOCs as a way of, of saving. And I, I, I try to understand, I've but I, I get it. I've never heard of that degree. before. Yes, yeah. yes, they would use the HELOCs and, as a, and, and I was like, why? In but all of a, my, my talking with financial people, I've never heard that recommended before either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'll say that. I, I like, I, I said, well, why do they need that to pay off their bills or whatever it may be? So let's no, say you have you, you may have a a credit card or whatever it is ten thousand dollars and they've used the HELOC to write a check and pay off the credit card. Well, the HELOC is probably less percentage wise than the credit card. Well, that I definitely have heard of people. So I think that was one of the reasons they were using it. But at the same time, their regular normal expenses might be let's say six thousand a month. So the 10,000 is paid off. The HELOC now is at six and then the next month and then it comes down more and more. So I think they was using the HELOC as a temporary um, cushion of less interest per month being paid towards a high end credit card. So instead of the 18% or whatever it was a month, they was using right. the HELOC, right. which was probably 5% over a year. So I said, okay, I, I get it. If they wanted to pay off something immediately, that yeah. was paying high interest, like you were saying. I've heard that. I said, okay, all right. But, uh, you know, it, 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 you, you always want to pay off the highest credit card. That I know. Yeah. I, know. Um, I use my credit cards every day. And I pay them And then off. you get points or whatever. I pay them off right. every paycheck. <laughs> oh, okay. I use them just like I would my debit card, you know. I use them, and yes, I, I do use them for points, but I do not recommend that for anybody who is challenged or tempted by overspending. It took a long time for me to get to the point where I can do that. Okay. So they have to really monitor. And... Yeah, I use them just like, okay. like so with um, my ComEd bill, my electric bill gets paid by the credit card. Mm -hmm. then I send the cash to the credit card in the same amount. Um, oh, okay. And I, I know months ahead um, what the amounts are going to be. Like looking at my spreadsheet, you would not know it was not cash. 
Okay. Okay. It's all still to the penny. I don't even wait for a balance. I know what's being paid out of each paycheck on the card. And so I take that amount and I pay the card. It's a wash. And do you do that bi-weekly? He gets paid every week, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. And we also live on one income, which I highly recommend if it's doable. Getting towards that, getting towards that. Yes. It can be tricky, but um, it, that sense of security, again, um, you know, we've got catching up to do with our retirement. So, but moving is what allowed us to do that, to bring it down to one income. Yeah, I would buy a lot of, uh, what's these uh, med notebooks when they're on sale or whatever it is, because I like to every month write it down getting my son to do that a little bit more he gets it but for some reason they just don't like writing but i said write out write it out so you can see it because it helped me because i've always wrote numbers mm -hmm. uh, you can do it on a computer but it just doesn't stick with me so far as writing it out for some yeah, reason yeah. so i you write it out i write out a lot write of it out yeah. for sure that's what works for me but it, that's the most important thing is to have a system that works for you, something you're going to use. If I send you a spreadsheet and you're like, I am not a spreadsheet guy, I'm going to do it for two months and then I'm not going to do it anymore. That's not what we want. If pen to paper is what you need to do to um, maintain, you know, the um, monitoring of the budget and the numbers, then by all means, okay. all right. <laughs> well awesome 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 uh, april thank you so much first of all um thank you guys i, I just i just want to say thank you I, you know um definitely can't wait not put this post this on here and uh let the masses hear um this great knowledge that you just attained for us and I, you know and change you know the whole thing about i think my whole thing is for the change mindsets because people have a certain a certain uh, knowledge base about money, but I think the tangible steps that you that you talk about can really help a lot of people out. Good. Uh, one more question: What are some of the books you did refer? Let me write that down. Some of you read that helped you. Books. Oh yes. Oh, um, not not the library. Not the library. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, most of my books that I have read are honestly more on the coaching, um, oh. Oh. but there is, I can't think of what it's called. There's, I think it's the psychology of money. Mm. Um, I'm sorry. I, I don't have a good reference source for and most of what I'm binging is coaching around money which then i get the knowledge but it's not necessarily <laughs> certain pod, certain youtubes or podcasts somebody you follow um well it used to be dave ramsey but <laughs> but it's not sustainable uh -huh. he does have good points i just don't agree with shaming people for being human right, and, right. um you know Yes, who's I think the you, lady who's the lady used to come on CNN? She's doing uh, Susie Orman. Susie Orman, I remember her. <laughs> I was Susie Orman. I, I'm not, I haven't really uh, watched too much of hers either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I in I the psychology, I think it was Jim Rohn. It was a few others that um, I can't remember their names that I used to listen to for motivation. Uh, uh, what's, what's the tall guy? Ugh. He's like the uh, tallest guy in the room. You should know him, Aaron. And, uh, he's been talking for years. He's been talking. Tony. Tony. Tony Robbins. There you go, Tony Robbins. Tony, Tony Robbins. Robbins. <laughs> for inspiration. For yes, inspiration. I listen to Tony Robbins. He's motivating. Have, he's motivating. Yes, he is. He is motivating. He's very motivating. Yes. Um, Rich Dad Poor Dad is one yes. that I read. Um. The Millionaire Next Door. 
No. Did you get that one? Okay. You know, I, I'm terrible. I, I I do audiobooks a lot when I'm driving, and it, there's there's been a lot. I just there's don't. a book on the why I did read the why I did read. I can't remember the the um, author, but okay. Psychology of money. Okay. Psychology of money. There's 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 one I'm trying to think of, and it's really good, and I cannot. Okay. Cannot think of it. Well, look, I'm going to say this. Uh, we could keep on keep the conversation going, on, but I'm going to end the recording. I just want We're to say April so much for everything you have provided for us. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I cannot wait to work with you on future projects. Yeah. And um, just to let you guys know the first uh, the first episode for the new YouTube page the the um, Veteran Transition Speaker Series is out already. I had Terry Hornberg talk about government contracts. So check that out. Thank you, guys. God bless you and talk to you mm -hmm. soon. See you next week with David Duvall. Okay. Thank you.